much. Hello, everybody. You should all be muted, which is a good thing. We have last still joining us, so I'll just talk to you for a moment. Um, sorry I missed the last one. Uh, had a bad eye, but um, here I am again. And today we've got a full program with Bob and Vienna, Tom and Marge for our education and entertainment. When it's convenient. And the next meeting will, of course, be in a fortnight's time on the 13th of June. And then we're carrying on with our fortnightly meetings. Um, although Martin and I did agree this morning that we were going to have August off. So August is going to be a holiday. We won't have any Zoom meetings in August. And I think, yes, just a couple of people in the waiting room before we actually start. So don't forget the rules. Uh, if we're going to do questions at the end of each paper, the three papers, so there'll be questions. And as, as long as we've, uh, as long as our speakers haven't run over too much, there'll be time <laughs> for five minutes or so questions. And as always, the way to ask a question is to raise your hand by going down, clicking at the bottom on reactions and raise your hand. And as always, don't forget that we're recording these sessions and the whole meeting will be put up on YouTube. So if you don't want your face to appear, then turn off your camera. If you don't want your voice to appear, don't say anything. Um, and I think those are all the roles. Martin has disappeared from my screen, so I don't know if he's still there, but I'll presume he is. So we're going to start. Um, we're very pleased to welcome Vienna Carol to us today. I think her first time with us on our Zoom meetings. Um, so welcome, Vienna, and Bob Walser. Many of you will know Bob from uh, from years back and from Shanties and uh, uh, Mystic Festivals and that sort of thing. So if I'll hand over, to, I don't know if I'm handing over to Bob or Vienna, but one or the other will take us on a sea trip. Terrific. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to see people. It's uh, so many old friends here and Carpenter team members. Thank you for being here. Um, off we go. Um, in the opening uh, sentence of his recent book, Gib Schreffler asks, how do we know what we know about shanties? He then presents a fascinating review of shanty literature, noting how assertions made by various writers were repeated or even plagiarized by subsequent writers, creating a body of accepted understanding that's rarely examined or questioned. Schreffler's story is a story of written discourse, of understanding built on earlier writing assumed, often by virtue of chronology, to be authoritative. One enjoyable, at least for me, aspect of Gibbs' work is how he displays the emperor's lack of clothing in various presumably reliable works. But you should read his book to find those yourself. All right. The book is itself part of a stream of discursive scholarship with which most of us are familiar and to which some of us contribute. That stream is grounded in ways of knowing that are centered in the written word, especially in the published or even better refereed and published word. And so my perspective is a little different. Uh, my mission is to share African-American history through art and through music, because I think that our, our songs tell our stories in the absence of a written verification. And so that is how I come to Black Sailors because I was researching them to write a play in which they were going to appear, but I didn't know how they sounded. So um, I found Jeffrey Bolster's book, Black Jack. And I really loved that book because it spoke about the agency of these men, how they traveled all over the world and brought back freedom stories and helped develop the freedom ethos of their land-based brethren. But I wanted to know more about the individual man and his relationship to slavery. Was he a slave? Was he a free person? Was he hired out? Who did he marry? Did he marry a slave person, an enslaved woman or a freed woman? Did he 
Did he pay for his relatives? Um, how did he fit in the town hierarchy? Was he part of the resistance? Was he a drifter? He drifted from port to port. And um, in, trying to, in trying to bring that person from the shadow, um, I referenced Toni Morrison's um, article, Sight of Memory, where she talks about being able to, to um, personify a life from an image, and in my instance, from sound. And so I know how the spiritual sound and how they can be used as codes or they can be used as spiritual upliftment. They can be used as work, as, uh, work songs, but I was completely ignorant about songs on the water. So then um, Nicole Singer um, told me about the Mystic Sea Music Festival and I went there and I was, as you say, gobsmacked because I walked around from a uh, um, workshop to um, plenary and I heard all this black music, I, which I had no uh, knowledge of, no previous knowledge of, but I knew the sound of it from um, my church experiences and my early childhood experiences. And then after a full day of listening to this music, then there was the German beer hall across the street and um and that was like a sexual secular church revival uh service for me because people would you know like in my grammy's church if you wanted to testify you stood up you said what you had to say and then you sang and people joined in so in this instance in the german beer hall people would stand up and they would just start singing and everybody would join in it was just amazing to me and I did not know not one song but I knew I knew the 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 structure and I knew the feeling and here we were having a secular revival service with beer and white people it was pretty amazing to me oh Vienna I love that story and I love your last line there uh, it seems to me that what you knew in your body at the German club connects with and affirms the historical record. The stories about black workers singing at their labors years before the earliest reports of the songs we now know as sea shanties. As foreign members likely know, the tradition of deep water shanties developed in the middle of the 19th century and declined as steam replaced sail. And if Stan Hugel's often repeated story is true, was well and truly finished when the Garth Pool ran aground in November of 1929. And we're using the term shanty today specifically to refer to work songs, not in the more general sense that it's used in TikTok or whatever these days. The earliest descriptions of what we now call sea shanties date from the 1820s and 30s. But long before that, Black workers, both enslaved and free, sang at their labors. Corn songs, stevedore songs, rowing songs, and cotton screwing chants were described by travelers. And uh, uh, throughout the uh, American South and the Caribbean in the late 18th and early years of the 19th century. Um, and this thread on the Mudcat Cafe, a number of researchers have contributed examples of this er these early uh, uh, songs. And over the last 10 years or so, this thread has gained uh, close to a thousand posts. So what we're going to do now is we're going to move on and consider a couple of examples in greater detail. A rowing song was uh, noted by a man named James Hungerford. Uh, it was published in 1859, but it was based on a trip made in 1832. And though rowing songs are mentioned earlier, this is the first example that I'm aware of anyway that includes musical notation. And here's what it sounds like. Are, are we meant to be hearing sound? Oh. I can't hear any sound. Are we meant to be hearing oh, it? Okay, hang on. 
Well, they might singing. have been sharing the wrong screen. They might have been singing very quietly. All right, hang on a second. Oh, we we tested this the other day and it worked. I think you were sharing your notes rather than the PowerPoint, Bob. Oh, dear me. Then I don't want to do that. I will go back and share the right thing. Let's try that again. My apologies. Go to the correct slide. Can you hear it now? Not yet. We got to the old plantation. We got the music on the screen, but no sound. Have you got to click share sound? Oh, we didn't have to do this the other day. Hang on. I have to go to the keynote. Or not to keynote. Sorry, to Zoom. Martin, can you help us? You should, you should when you go to the um, choice of screens on that screen, down the bottom left, there is a box to tick for share. Oh, all right, I will look for it again. My apologies, I'll be there shortly. Yeah, don't, don't worry, we have this, <laughs> it's the same problem every time. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it, always, it always goes wrong at this point, just when we've all got settled in. Share a screen, share a sound. There we go. Okay. One more try. Here we go. Farewell, fellow servants. Oh, ho. Is it playing now? Oh, ho. Yes, it is. Yes. I'm one way to leave you. Oh, ho. Oh, ho. I'm going to leave the old county. Oh, ho. Oh, ho. I'm sold off to Georgie. Oh, ho, 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 farewell, old plantation. Oh, ho, oh, ho, farewell, the old quarter. Oh, ho, oh, ho, and daddy and mammy. Oh, ho, oh, ho, I'm master and missus. Oh, ho, oh, ho, oh, ho, my dear wife and one child. Oh ho, oh ho, my poor heart is breaking. Oh ho, oh ho, no more shall I see you. Oh ho, oh ho, oh no more forever. Oh ho, oh ho. So when we started this project, uh, Bob wanted me to sing this song. I had the hardest time singing this song because of the way that it's laid out. It's laid out in such a way as to, the singer seems to acquiesce to his uh, fate. And, um, and, and that was really hard for me, especially as I want to show how we were part of our own freedom story. Um, but then I thought of, uh, of an ex-slave, Ar uh, Arnold Graxton who lived in Kentucky and his, his story was collected by the WPA workers. And um, he rode folks to, to freedom for four years across the Ohio River, even though he stayed in his enslaved status that time. So I could imagine him during the day in order to, um, in order to, 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 to soothe the uh, masters and and, and keep them off his trail that he might sing something like this while he was doing his business at night, helping to free people as an underground railroad conductor. And clearly this song was more than a help to the work. Uh, as Hungerford notes that the song made the white passengers in the boat uncomfortable, reducing some of them to tears. And Vianna, I love the way you take the song, which could be heard simply as a piece of music, and you go deeper and think about the person, the life of the singer. There's more to the story than crotchets and quavers. All right, moving on. Was you ever in Mobile Bay screwing cotton all the day? Variations of that couplet are found in quite a few shanties. In fact, Stan Hugel, the sailor author of Shanties from the Seven Seas, considered by many the magnum opus of sea shanties, 
considered Mobile, Alabama, a quote unquote shanty mart where musical traditions were exchanged between workers screwing cotton and deep water sailors who spent time ashore doing this work to avoid crossing the Atlantic in winter and who overheard the screw, screw gangs at their work. As most traditional song forum members are aware, uh, the cotton was the economic backbone of the Southern United States for much of the 19th century. Since most of the spinning and weaving was done elsewhere, cotton had to be packed into ships for export. Teams of typically five men used jack screws to cram as much cotton into the hold of a vessel as they possibly could. Work that was accompanied by singing. And this went on for decades. And unlike deep water shanties, which were used intermittently, uh, cotton screwing went on continuously for days uh, during the shipping season. And yet, there is very little information that survives about the work itself or the songs that were sung. To date, only a handful of images and fewer than a dozen songs have been located. And here I'd like to acknowledge Gib Schreffler's generosity in sharing his research on this topic. As with his book mentioned earlier, Gib has gathered a lot of source material together. And from that evidence has developed uh, a narrative. That's his story to tell. I'm not gonna steal his thunder. Today, we want to emphasize that these songs were being sung by black laborers in Charleston, Mobile, New Orleans, and other ports, as Hugo and others have noted, before the era, the great era of deep water shanties. Now it's frustrating that so little evidence of this tradition survives. Today, you can visit sailing ships and sea or even participate on hauling a topsail aloft using blow the man down, but there's nowhere you can go to see a cotton screwing demonstration, let alone try it yourself. In fact, I'm not aware of anywhere you can go to even see a jack screw. The only photograph of cotton screwing that uh, of which I'm aware is one that's held by the New York uh, Public Library. In, in this picture, you can see two crews at work. Each crew uh, includes four men turning a jack screw. One of the few documented cotton screwing songs is one sung by James E. Scott and published in 1918 by Natalie Curlis Berlin. And it ran something like this, and I hope the sound goes, let's see. Screw this cotton, huh. screw this cotton, huh. screw this cotton, huh. screw it tight, huh. screw this cotton, huh. screw this cotton, huh. screw this cotton, huh. with all your might. Huh. Now, this example is fascinating to me because of that vocable huh, which indicates the moment of coordinated effort by the screwmen. And it's just like that that was used by Black Longshoremen recorded in Tampa, Florida in 1944. The song Mobile Bay that goes something like, way down on the Mobile Bay, way, huh, way down on the Mobile Bay, so long, so long, huh. So you have that, that vocable being used the same, the same way. Um, and I'm going to skip ahead here because we're running a little long. We're going to skip that slide as much as I like it. And go on to the next one. Um, because the history of shanties is not just a history of the deep water sailing songs that declined as uh, sail replaced steamed, but it continued. There was black work song that continued beyond 1929 when the Garth Bull ran aground. There are the Menhaden songs uh, that you may be familiar with, hauling nets that continued into the 1950s. And there was also the um, whaling songs that were recorded into the 1950s and 60s by uh, Roger Abrahams and Jack Sinesco and others. Now, in the midst of last winter's TikTok shanty craze, Saturday Night Live presented a sea, sh sea shanty skit. And Martin, if you could throw that uh, link into the chat for people who want to see this later, that would be great. In the skit, a diverse group of sailors sing a parody of Soon May the Wellermen Come with lines like, we'll all get scurvy and die. Now, the curious thing about this skit is that all of the sort of uh, people playing sailors 
Saturday Night Live actors speak in various British-ish accents. Why did these actors or the scriptwriters feel it was necessary or appropriate to highlight the Britishness of their pseudo shanty? Today, we've shared parts of sea shanty history rooted not in hearty lads from the British Isles, but in a tradition of black work song that both preceded and succeeded the age of deep water shanties. But you may ask, is this really news? Certainly most of the published shanty collectors acknowledge the contributions of black singers to deep water shanty traditions, didn't they? Well, yes, many did, though at times in terms that were pejorative or otherwise problematic. But the deeper problem is not the language, it's the narrative. A narrative that locates shanties in Anglo-American musical history influenced by Black musical tradition. What we presented today is only a sample, but the weight of the evidence, historical and corporal, is clear. The popular narrative is inside out. Taken as a whole, Deepwater Shanties did not develop from Anglo-American roots with Black influence. They developed from Black work song traditions, rowing, cotton screwing, and others, which were over time adopted, adapted, and augmented by white sailors. Now, I live in Minneapolis, and Vienna and I began our work together shortly before the trial of Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd. And as we were getting to know each other, Dante Wright was killed. The main street, a block from my home, was boarded up, and there were National Guard troops with machine guns on street corners in my neighborhood. In that context, the stories told about sea shanties may seem trivial, but at least to me. I completely disagree. They're not at all trivial. I think that they're not at all trivial because they tell the stories of us as a people. We're invisible in our own history and certainly in our own freedom story. I think that these stories are really, really important so we can get to know people, so we all can get to know people like George Floyd and Dante Wright and see them as individuals. I think these songs are a way in. Thank you, Vienna. That's what I was going to say. I couldn't agree more. The Saturday Night Live skit enacts a widespread but inaccurate history that places white traditions and singers with British accents at the center of shanty history and only acknowledges Black influence. But the evidence, and we've just given Tiny a sample, tells us that the story of Deepwater Shanties is that they were an offshoot or descendant of Black work song, appropriated, adapted, and expanded by white sailors. Now, while I don't know everyone in this meeting here, I do know a number of you, and my impression that this forum includes performers, teachers, and scholars who write about traditional music. Because you are who you are, you can help correct the popular misunderstanding of shanty history and to locate deep water shanties where they belong, emerging from and succeeded by the longer and deeper history of Black maritime work song. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob and Vienna. That was an excellent start to this afternoon session. And, um, gave us all a lot to think about, especially those of us in Britain. Um, as, as always, if you want to ask a question, anybody, please put your hand up. And because uh, we, we, again, thank you for uh, finishing on time, you know, and <laughs> that was excellent. <laughs> I wish everybody did that. Yeah. Uh, we've got two questions. I mean, one of the comments I would make is that we're, we're fairly used within the folk song research world with the fact that people repeat what they read before right. and that you get this chain of um, apparently authoritative voices and the more they say it the more you believe it because you've read it five times so it must be true um, and it's really important to go back to the start and say all right what are the you know where does this chain of evidence come from which is exactly what you've done so thank you thank you for that now, Elizabeth, you've got your hand up first. Elizabeth now. Yes, um, I've become interested partly because during the early 70s, I recorded a record of uh, John Wright and Catherine Perrier, who talked a bit about 
a French shanty tradition in France. And I remember later in uh, conversations with Ellen Cohn, who worked at Mystic sometimes, that she too was aware of some of the French shanties. And then later, more recently, Stéphane San Filippo sang a version of what he thought of as sort of an ancestral form of Ruben Ranzo from Sicily. So I'm wondering if you've looked at sort of the Anglo-American narrative of shanties in a broader international light. After all, these people did move in very international communities. And I'm wondering whether we need to broaden our notion of how set shanties were transformed and borrowed from other cultures and countries. C'est Jean-François de Nantes, oui, oui, oui. Ah, yes, uh, the French uh, shanty tradition is rich. And of course, as some people probably know, the place in this in the world right now where you can hear shanties more than any other is Poland. Yes. Uh, so yeah, that um, in a 15 minute presentation, there actually had a reference to the work of the uh, Michel Collou and the people um, at Chasse-Marais and Dastum in, in France. Uh, so yes, there's a much larger and richer story around the international part that I would love to treat, but 15 minutes didn't allow for that. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, it's Bob, a good story. We're going to move on. Now we've got lots of people want to ask questions. So people, keep it short. Abby, <laughs> Abby Sale. Hello, Abby, with a hat on me. Yeah. That's me. Um, just, just to add to the confusion, but maybe you guys could debunk or expand on it. I believe it's Roger Abramson, Abramson who suggests only that the word shanty itself comes from Caribbean shanty moving songs that were done communally to pull the shanties off the, the coast away from storms in, in that weather. Uh, that's so a big one. Shanties, deb moving shanties, right. yeah. Yeah, the debate about the uh, etymology of the word goes on and on and on, and there's articles written about it. I, and I have my opinions, but they're no more valid than anybody else's. Nobody knows. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, I have opinions on that too. Ian, Ian Russell, next. Hi. Sorry to keep you waiting there. Um, I'd like to ask Bob if there are any black performers of shanties at Mystic or, or anywhere else, or for that matter, in the past 50 years, have there been any black performers of shanties performing at festivals and gatherings? Uh, the uh, group, the Barely Whalers uh, from Barely in the Caribbean came to Mystic um, and there were two different groups of Manhattan uh, singers who uh, performed at Mystic, but uh, one of the things that's been uh, uh, rather startling actually to me and what, one of the reasons why when uh, a mutual friend suggested I get back in touch with Vienna, I was excited to do that is because there have been so few uh, singers, black singers, uh, singers of color who have been interested in the uh, the the broader shanty repertoire, you know, the people from the Manhattan groups or the uh, Caribbean only sing the material from their particular tradition and haven't, um, you know, they would not be likely to sing Blow Boys Blow or uh, Blow the Man Down. They sing, you know, the songs from their tradition. So that's, um, that's something that I would love to see, but I don't see it very much. I would like to add that you know it's 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 not it's not really that people are not interested it's that our history is lost to us so ah. we don't even know about these songs i mean there's so much of our history that has just been compressed depressed eliminated that we don't know about but i, I think that people would be interested if they knew thank you Vienna. can we move on to march yeah, I'm. I'm not a shanty scholar, but I. But this, the presentation isn't news to me. In a, I mean, even reading Moby Dick back when I was very young, I I inferred just because um, of the constant references to the international uh, crew on the on the Pequod that 
that surely and and I don't I don't know whether uh, Melville actually referred to um, specific shanties or specific um, um, songs being sung by 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 the crews. I don't I don't remember that, but I just sort of inferred that that was probably the case. Hi, thank thank you much. Uh, we're running out of time, Conrad. Have you got a very 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 short question? This is very short. And uh, not so much a question. In Maryland, we have tobacco packing. I think they wrote, they packed them in the same way, putting tobacco into big containers, hog beds, rolling them down Rolling Road. I'm pretty sure I've heard it's longer too. In terms of loss of, of song tradition, it's always tragic when a community loses its song. But we have to remember as human beings, there's always a force that is pulling the artifacts from our hands and burying them in the ground artifacts such as songs, either somebody else is doing it or you are doing it. And then archaeologists and historians and folklore have to go dig them back up again. But it's a process that every group, I think, has going on. Even the Geordies that I've met in interview, they have lost songs. They have forgotten their tradition. They don't, they don't have a slave background, but they have lost. And lots of cultures lose. And not only because of their own fault, the Irish immigrants lost because they couldn't carry the songs over in their baggage. That's how I became the lost luggage department of the local Irish. They, they couldn't possibly use the time. It was deprived of them by their economic state and the people above them. So having a song loss problem is something that we need to address, I think, across the board and seek explanations for how it works and find ways to deal with it. Someday, the things that we're digging out of the ground will overwhelm us. But as everybody's got the same sort of problem. And if we work together, we can get the mechanics and the principles out of it. There you go. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Conrad. Thank you for giving that short. Uh, <laughs> we've got, uh, Bob, Bob and Vienna, thanks again for that uh, presentation. And it I'm was six really, one. We really could keep talking about this forever, but we're not going to because we've got to move on. To. So another round of applause for Bob and Fiona. Thank you very much, guys. And we're moving on to Tom. Tom Pettit, who's um, many of us have known for many, many years. Um, and he gets the prize for the most complicated handout ever, I think. Uh, you should have received the handout um, with the email about this mess, this uh, meeting. To, Tom, do we need to see the handout? Are you no. going to display it? No, no. I'm, I'm trained to address people who haven't seen the handout. I'm a university lecturer. Right, good. That's good. <laughs> we, we manage. I will make myself sort of I will clarify things, even, even though people haven't got it or seen it. Fine. Over to you then, Tom. Thank uh, you. Thanks, yes. And I, I, I gather I'm unmuted. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to sort of tell you about my discursive catalogue of English murdered sweetheart ballads, which is sort of complete, uh, but it was not something undertaken for its own sake. It was a, a by, it is a byproduct of my research on the ballads, and in turn, conversely, it's designed to enable further contextually enhanced explorations by myself or others. And this I propose to illustrate by invoking the particular murdered sweetheart ballad represented by select parallel texts on the longer of the two PDF hands out, handouts uh, you received yesterday. They are more to be mementos of our meeting that you can examine at your leisure in the light of my presentation. Here. Well, under various titles and varying round numbers, uh, this song has had, at least in Scotland, a long and lively career as a traditional song. Around 1800, it was collected by James Beattie from an unidentified singer. Around 1900, it was collected by Gavin Greig from several singers. Uh, it was recorded from the singing of William Matteson in the 1930s by James Madison Carpenter and again in the 1950s by Hamish Henderson and finally it was recorded by Bill Leader in 1967 from the singing of Cameron Turriff 
of which Martin will now give us a 43 second two stanza burst. We have, we have liftoff. Not yet. Oh. It's William Graham, it is my name in London, I did well. I love the farmer's daughter, I love the river so well. I love the farmer's daughter, and times were hard to die, and it's for my own offense, no I must die. <coughs> I laid her up for London, I laid her down a ton, I laid her up through London and to young grassy tun, and there I took the wells of her, my sail to satisfy, and it's for my own offense, no I must die. Fine, thank you, Martin. Well, that, if you like, is the end of the road of, of the song, but the the story begins 300 years before Turriff's performance, round about 1660. Uh, the song originated as an English broadside ballad, the downfall of William Grismond, and the first steps of its entry into singing tradition are documented firstly by the specification uh, of the tune to which it is to be sung, and then secondly, a decade or so later, by the specification on another broadside ballad that it was to be sung to the tune of William Grismond, indicating in the interim it had been sung sufficiently often for the tune to be recognized under this new name. So let me introduce Margaret Clark of Lentwerdain in Herefordshire. This ballad may not quite have been the first murdered sweetheart ballad, but she was very likely the first murdered sweetheart to be balladized. Uh, there were some 30 years between the, between the murder and the ballad. In its earliest printings, the full title confidently, consistently and incorrectly assigns the murder to the 22nd of March 1650. In a brilliant scholarly breakthrough, I googled the name of the village with the wrong spelling, which turned out to be the spelling used by the government of Charles I, and I stumbled across hitherto unremarked administrative documents, one of which is on the handout, generated when the possible award of a royal pardon to Grismond was generating public opposition. These documents confirm that the ballad is indeed based on actual events, and identify the murdered sweetheart who is unnamed in the ballad as Margaret Clark. But they also reveal it was 20 years earlier, on or about the 15th of November of November 1629, that she was murdered after informing Grisman she was bearing his child. Grisman admitted to the authorities that he feared this might jeopardize, as it probably would, his plans for marrying another wealthier woman and that he cut her throat leaving her for dead in the broom field where she had asked her to join him. He absconded when the body was discovered a week later, but having embarked for Ireland, the ship he was on had to turn back because of contrary winds. And making his way across country, he was apprehended by the two local men. I assume they were constables who had gone in pursuit of him. As in other cases, many other cases, except this is very early, such independent documentation enables a reliable assessment of the degree to which the ballad author kept to the facts of the case or adjusted them into conformity with the conventions of crime and execution, news balladry, and more specifically, the generic paradigm for the murder of Sweetheart Ballad. At this early date, the paradigm may not have been fully developed, but anyway, the known facts being closely in line with what became the traditional scenario, no serious adjustment would have been necessary, except perhaps on the relationship between Grismond and his father, who in the ballad, his gold he did not spare to save Grismond from the gallows, evidently in pursuit of that royal pardon. Invocations of the murderer's loving parents and their anguish 
did become a feature of murdered sweetheart ballads, but the constable who arrested the real William Grismond, not in the documents, not in the handout, uh, reported him as saying that his father had often wished him hanged, and now he had his wish and might see him hanged. Turning to the genre, and so to the PDF with a list of the ballads in the, in the genre, William Grismond belongs to the earlier of the two phases of its historical development, in which the ballads are longer, sometimes in parts, often in black letter, landscape format, with a fondness for titles prefacing tragedy with the name of an English country or city. The later phase, effectively the 19th century, sees the publication of shorter ballads in white letter and portrait format, often as detachable slip ballads, mostly identified by the name of the murdered sweetheart and or, and or of the murderous lover. My handout indicates by subtle color coding uh, two distinct subgenres which can be established on the basis of the aftermath of the murder, which achieves the destruction of the murderous lover, balancing and requiting the death of the sweetheart. The, prepon the preponderant form is a regular judicial process with uh, arrest, trial, condemnation, execution, uh, in ballads which claim, and in many cases do, to report, claim to, and in many, many cases do, report actual cases. William Grismond is a particularly early instance of this, as it is of the device of presenting the narrative in the voice of the murderer as he awaits execution. Uh, a significant minority of ballads, however, mostly from the earlier period, deploy an alternative, supernatural process involving divine or diabolical intervention in bringing the murder to book. Such ballads make little effort to assert the truth of the story, and the action is mainly set among the higher social classes, where the weapon of choice is a sword rather than a knife. Of course, ballads on broadsides only qualify as traditional song when they enter singing tradition. And I've enter, indicated in red out to the right the nine murdered sweetheart ballads of the 55 or so there were, for which we know this happened by virtue of it being recorded from source singers. The accessibility of both printed originals and derivative performances encourages two research approaches which are not unique to murdered sweetheart ballads, uh, but which take on a particular significance and colouring in this context. The first is the matter of selection by tradition. Are there potentially instrumental common characteristics among those songs within this genre which achieved this particular form of public acceptance. Alongside a strong and coherent narrative line, which is so obvious I won't pursue it further, the matter of gender balance has become an increasingly significant notion for me, culminating precisely in this examination of William Grismond. In broadsides, in the broadsides generally, up to and including the murder, the sweetheart and lover, of course, share attention. But in the aftermath, attention and quite often sympathy shifts to the lover murderer alone. But most of the broadside ballads that entered singing tradition have redressed that post mortem imbalance in some way. For example, through emphasis on the discovery of the body. This can be quantitative by just lingering over it, as William Grisman does, through two repetitive stanzas, or qualitative, say, through a striking description like the tied in a sack and mangle led with many a ghastly wound of the Suffolk tragedy. A more powerful way is to accord the sweetheart some kind of post-mortem agency the capability of making things happen in the punishment of the murderer. And this can in turn be material, corporal even, as when the blood of Mary Thompson did betray her murderer, when it stained the lake into which she had thrown her body, when the jawbone of Maria Martin is displayed as evidence in the trial. It can be psychological, as the lover has compulsive thoughts, is tortured by 
compulsive thoughts of his victim. Most strikingly, the agency can be supernatural, uh, can be supernatural. Of the ballads making it into singing tradition, only the gospel tragedy has a fully fledged supernatural aftermath in which the sweetheart's ghost pursues the murderer and drives him to suicide. But there are others where some kind of supernatural intervention, where there is some kind of supernatural intervention which enables uh, the revenge uh, intervention by the sweetheart. In the Oxford tragedy, in accordance with the murdered girl's dying curse, a miraculous permanently flowering rose bush grows over the spot where she's buried, but dies when the murderer touches it. The two ballads on the Maria Martin case make much of her mother's dreams, uh, revealing that the sweetheart's body is buried in the notorious red barn. And in the murder of Maria Martin, the revelatory dream uh, includes uh, a fully fledged visitation by the girl spirit. And when the body of the drowned sweetheart in the Berkshire tragedy is found floating outside her father's house the day before the trial, we can re re reasonably assume both supernatural and female agency. Exceptionally, female agency is not explicitly the cause of the supernatural intervention in William Grismond, our ballad, but that is emphatically remedied in its singing tradition, to which finally uh, we now turn. The, because the second avenue of research enabled by this situation is precisely the opportunity to measure and analyze what the late John Foley called the verbal morphing that's occurred in the course of transmission through transmission through the memories and the and the performances of the singers. Now, it might be anticipated that after centuries in singing tradition, this morphing will have been particularly extensive and informative in those five ballads from the earlier phase. Were it not for the circumstance evident from the handout that four of them, the continuity, for four of them, the continuity between the original early broadside and the version collected from singing tradition has been disrupted by the publication of a later intermediate broadside with a revised, invariably reduced version of the ballad, a circumstance conducive to scholarly disagreement among me and others present, on which I will not expatiate here. This merely enhances the significance of William Grismond, as until further notice, uh, the, this is, it is the sole instance where there is no intermediate broadside and uniquely where the versions have been recorded from singing tradition at intervals through three ensuing centuries. There are remarkable changes in form and style, uh, but they are not specific to Murdered Sweetheart Ballad, so I'd rather draw your attention to the major discernible trend with regard to content, and that is precisely the reinforcing of that same factor already identified as significant in the adoption of such ballads into singing tradition. That's to say, female agency becomes palpably more prominent among the stanzas that remain and the stanzas that are added as William Grismond becomes William Geisman and Willie Graham and as Lanter Dine becomes London Town. There's a striking incidence in that strange altruistic exclamation of the drying of the dying sweetheart urging her murderous lover to deny his guilt and escape by sea i guess it's, an, it's a contamination from some other ballad but it adds to the dramatic quality of this scene and in so doing strengthens the female agency in the ballad whatever her motives which might can be discussed whatever her motives she seeks successfully to influence the action of her murderous lover Margaret Clark herself does not speak or act subsequently, even as a ghost, but it's hard not to speculate that in singing tradition, she acquires a kind of surrogate in the form of the ship, the ship on which her murderer seeks to escape. The real William Grisman stated merely that the ship was turned back by a contrary wind. 
The broadside, with no reference to the weather, says it's because the ship was troubled. This incipient per personification is taken further in the two sung versions, uh, and it may not be a coincidence that while in the broadside, Grismond merely got on shipboard, in them it is, a vari it is variations of on good shipboard, uh, I'm, I'm tempted to name it the good ship Margaret, for in a familiar convention not deployed in the broadside, the ship is now a she, which actively and willfully opposes his escape. In 1800, the ship she would not sail again. In 1900, the ship she would not leave the land. And there's a similar slower progression in that stanza where the sailors explain the cause of the trouble. It culminates in the 1900 version where the captain states and reiterates, I have a murderer on my ship, she will not take the sea. And says it twice. She, I have a murderer on my ship, she will not go with me. Just as under similar circumstances in, in Bonnie in Child 24, Bonnie Annie, the captain says, there's fey folk in our ship, she winna sail for me. Most, stri most striking is the development of the extra stanza in all three sung versions, another external contamination specifying the procedure, casting cavils, I presume, a drawing of lots by which the lover murder was identified as the sinner on, on board. The earliest sung version states quite neutrally that the lots, the cavils, fell on me. But the two later in a subconscious or willfully possibly willful misunderstanding, uh, I beg your pardon, a, a possibly willful misunderstanding, they refer to the process as casting the cable. Uh, envisage, it seems, as a kind of ritual in which whatever this is, is done three times. It's evidently the ship's cable that is cast, and in the 1900 version, a whole stanza reiterates three times that the ritual is performed by the ship herself. Three times she cast her cable, three times it fell on me. Three times she cast her cable, but my tongue it would not lie. Three times she cast her cable, and the third time fell on me. I'm about to end. Uh, my calculation says that's 18 minutes and 45 seconds. Uh, not content with this, Singing tradition also felt the need, it seems, to accord agency to a quite different female, perhaps predictably in Scottish balladry, the murderous lover's mother. In this version, in the version from 1800, she usurps the broadside role of the father in spending gold in a vain attempt to save him from the gallows, the murderous lover from the gallows. Less benignly, in the version from 1900, she is the actual instigator of the crime. Let the curse fall on my own two hands, laments the murderous lover, now facing execution, but also likewise unto my mother, she did fill my heart with pride, just as the patricidal son in the B version of Charles Edward parts from his own mother dear with the valediction. The curse of hell from me shall ye bear, such counsels you gave to me. Oh, well, I've said it before, and I'll conclude by saying it again. In terms of both form and content, uh, content within this murdered sweetheart ballad, as in several others, there's a real child ballad struggling to get out. And it is to the mechanics of singing tradition that we owe this achievement. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much, Tom. Round of applause for Tom. Or Thomas, as it says. Thank you, Tom. That was, again, excellent and thought provoking. And we have some time for questions if anybody wants to raise their hand. Um, I'll start off by saying that. You're saying that this is the only one of the early broadside uh, sweetheart ballads that doesn't seem to have yes. um, an intermediate sort of cut down version. That's right. That's yeah. right. It's, it's, but, a, it's the lone survivor. And uh, I'm waiting for on, 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 on prior form, David Atkinson will find one. 
Right, exactly. That was, that was my he's question. Done, he's done that for me in a positive, positive <laughs> sense before. And I, I, I had guessed there was a, an, uh, uh, an earlier version of Mary Thompson, and he, he had it within a month. Right. Uh, so, as, and, uh, until further notice. But the, the only one. The, but the fact remains that the one that is sung the, um, is shorter. I mean, the sung versions are significantly shorter oh, yes. than the original. Yes, yes, yes. massively. The, massively. So the, it's on. It's on. Is it thirty some? And they, they are. They are six line. They are six line stanzas. So it's uh, the 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 original is twenty two stanzas. So that's thirty three of your usual quatrains. It goes. It goes from thirty three to ten. Right. So the same. You know, they are they are centuries apart. Uh, all the oral version. Well, they're nine, ten, eight. Uh, right. Six so the same process has happened. Yes, indeed. Yes, even, indeed. Even without that intermediate. Now, David does have his hand up. Yeah, I thought so. Over to you, David. Uh, well, not to tell you that I found one. No, I was desperately hoping that I I could. Um, what about things like the Scots Musical Museum? Is it in that? Uh, I was just trying to check, but I can't do that quickly enough. And um, one wonders whether that kind of thing fed into Scottish Brother. singing. Okay. Well, uh, this is this is the place where if anyone if anyone out there knows about this, please raise their hand and and wave their arms. Uh, well, uh, Ian Ian's got his hand up. So I don't know if that's a new question or the same one. So, Ian. <clears throat> Definitely a new question, Steve. Ah, right. Um, shall I carry on? Yes, please do. Yeah. Um, Tom, I wonder if you could, um, something I might have missed, but I wonder if you could um, relate uh, the, the ballad in question with uh, the Butcher Boy family of ballads and also the Texas Ranger family. I don't know about the Texas Ranger. Uh, there, are, there are two possible... There are two possible confusions here. Uh, the butcher boy develops from the Berkshire tragedy. The miller has turned into a butcher. I, and I, I think, I think, and I think the round index has been corrected. If, if it's the same butcher boy that we're thinking of, it's a butcher boy who kills his sweetheart because she's pregnant. If it's that ballad, then that ballad is a Scottish derivative of the, what starts off as the Ber Berkshire tragedy. The other confusion, I don't know if it's the Texas Ranger, the other confusion one reads in the literature is with uh, Captain Glenn, the New York trader. Uh, the ballads which are also about um, drawing lots to identify a murderer on board. And they are sometimes lumped together with this one as being, as being variants of the same ballad, but they are not. It's just the one motif in the, in the other one I'm referring to. Uh, the New York trader group, uh, the, the, it's the captain who has murdered, I think, his entire family uh, and, and had, had, had children with his mother, um, who was identified and is forgiven by, in one version, he's forgiven by the Virgin Mary, uh, but it's, it's a different group. It's not, it's not a murdered sweetheart ballad. Texas Ranger, I can't place. I'd, I'd need a quick summary. I think we'll have to move on before. That's okay. That, but thanks, Tom. But um, one last question, Tom. Would you recommend other people to use your methodology, if you like, um, for other genre, other types of song, other subjects, yes. other genres? Do you think it works well? Yes, it does. Um, it, I seem to have been doing this most of my career now. I, I am the parallel text person in several fields of research. I do this with, with Hamlet and Romeo and Juliet uh, the, and, and, and fairy tales and so on. Uh, when you, if you want to understand what's happening with a song and you know you have the original, if, it, if you're quite certain it derives from a broadside ballad, as you do with a crime and execution ballad, then you juxtapose with that versions from singing tradition and unless there's one of these pesky intermediate ballads, which is not with Maria Martin and the others, uh, then you can see exactly the difference between them is exactly the impact of reproduction from memory in performance. Uh, 
and transmission from person to person in performance. And in my experience, both with ballads and with Hamlet and, and Romeo and Juliet, uh, the, the processes are the same. The introduction of, um, well, the, the loss of unnecessary material and the, ge the generation of interesting uh, verbal repetitions. So it, 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 it's a way of identifying what singing tradition does, what singing tradition does when it, when it converts a broadside ballad into a traditional song. And it's all to the good. Excellent. So all you need is a lot of versions and 30 or 40 years yes. to work on it. Yes. I think that's fair enough. That's not too much to ask everybody. Yeah. Anyway, thank you, Tom. Can we, um, another round of applause for Tom for that. That was, again, very enlightening. I'll go back to the handouts and um, have another look at them. So we're going to move on to our third presenter, Marge. Yeah, uh, was, I'm here. Hello, she was with us uh, last time, fortnight ago, and we ran out of time. So Marge is back to continue with okay. her. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, great. And I will just give a teensy, very, very short recap of last week and just ask you to listen to the video presentation because that... Um, presentation took quite a long time. But to recap, I talked about six types of songs that I identified in Newtown Butler. This was during the course of my dissertation research, mostly in the late 1970s and into the 1980s. So the six types of songs that were sung in the community at the time of my research were local songs, songs composed locally celebrating people, places, and events in living memory. Um, and a lot of them had to do with sport, hunting, Gaelic football, cockfighting, but also celebrating the um, beauties of the area, usually sung in the pubs. Number two, ballads and broadsides sung more widely in Ireland and in the English, Irish and English speaking world, I mean, English speaking world, but uh, rarely sung in the pubs or not sung in the pubs. Number three, quote unquote, treason songs, which were partisan uh, political songs frequently sung um, in the pubs. Or number four, stage Irish songs, not associated with particular singers, but sung by a whole company at a party or in the pub. Number five, country western songs disseminated through radio and uh, and TV and records and um, known by sort of everybody. And then six were, were comic songs that were referred to, dis, that were referred to disparagingly as opposed to quote unquote ballads. Um, the, then I talked about song learning, um, often begun in childhood, um, passively at first, and then some people took a more active, um, a, a more active role by actually asking people to teach them songs and would even actually write them down, um, um, as men and women grew up grew up and their their paths tended to uh, shift because men um, had access to um, the hunting sprees the pubs women um, uh, that was not those networks were not available to women um, so um, so I covered all that last week. So now I'm going to get back to the um, functions of folk song. So the first function of folk song that I talked about last week was the um, an invocation of place, uh, the identification, um, the um, invocation of particular identities, whether it was the identification with place. Um, um, yeah, the tradition provided a mechanism whereby singers and audience members could selectively invoke 
and affirm particular identities that could encompass a sense of place in the community. And here I talked about local songs. I talked about um, the um, importance of place, the notion of subsistence, that the hunt could actually be a metaphor for the struggle for subsistence. Um, and, and I talked about um, also local, uh, that physical and um, social um, sense of place um, were, were kind of integrally connected. And I talked about the lovely River Finn um, as also being a location, not, not only was it a, 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 a a beauty, a beauty spot, but the, the author, it was a place where he went to school and where his, uh, an Irish king, his dwelling had in a place of long gone by. So I went through that really quickly, but you know, you can listen to last week's thing. Okay, so number two, the tradition provided a means of conflict management. Um, and I think I was up to, I mean, I had to rush through that last time. Okay, so um, we, um, as you know, uh, this was in a border community in Northern Ireland um, that was very much impacted by the troubles. And so, but on the other hand, so, but people had to sort of get along um, um, as neighbors. I mean, on the one hand, people had to, um, it was expected that you were going to be loyal to quote unquote, your side of the house. On the other hand, people didn't live in ghettos and they were neighbors and people um, help, needed to help each other. So to, um, so there were a number of strategies that people um, invoked. Um, one of these was um, joking. It was inter and inter party inter and intra party joking um here's a george latimer a protestant told me this story um and he said this to he told this to protestant family members and myself there was a man uh, maybe i told you this before that patty sherry's father patty was a catholic um enlist was in listeniski fair and seemingly if you gave these ballad singers a few pence, they'd play any song you fancied, any tune you fancied. So this was a Protestant man gave the ballad singer um, a couple of pence to sing a Protestant song. But Patty Sherry's father was a bit of a divil anyway, and he went on the quiet and he gave the ballad singer a couple of pence to play a Fenian song or a rebel song. And the man that had got them to play a Protestant song didn't know the difference one tune from another. So whatever he'd have played, he patted him on the back. He says, that's the best wee tune I heard in a long time. I witnessed also um, an incident in which um, um, a Catholic, a Protestant guy, um, after having heard during a particular um, pub session, um, the Manchester martyrs. Um, so the Protestant guy dares his Catholic singing buddy, Jimmy Halpin, to sing the sash. And then what Jimmy does and his and Francie Conlon too, they kind of stand things on their head. He um, so they sing the sash, but there's a lot of taunting, and then ultimately um, the Catholic guy get his jabs in and I would though I'd love to play this for you um I am told that if you want to hear this you need to email privately because some of the language is pretty raunchy um anyway so but it was really fascinating to see how these guys stood expectations on their heads and in, indeed even transcended uh conflict they they again played with expectations. They actually brought to the fore and acknowledged the conflict 
But then through this joking around, they were able to actually transcend it. Now, of course, these friends could, on, could only do this because they knew each other well. Um, and so, you know, you couldn't do this among um, people who didn't know each other because you didn't know what the consequences might be. But these were, these were good buddies. Um, also, with regard to conflict management, there was a strict code of etiquette, um, especially when a large crowd was present and when patrons were unsure of the sensibilities of the crowd. That code was strictly invoked in the realm of song. John McGuire said that when singing in public, he liked to um, remain uh, neutral in his song cho choices. And so he avoided singing Matt Fitzpatrick. Um, and I hope I can give a whole paper on Matt Fitzpatrick sometime. But anyway, um, it was permissible for, um, for, uh, for John to sing and for Catholics to sing Gaelic football songs. And he invariably chose the Hardy Sons of Dan or the Bold 15. And we hold, heard the Bold 15 last time. When party songs were sung, and as Henry Glassie also noted, um, the songs sung were those that celebrated um, heroes and martyrs without denigrating the other side. So from the Manchester martyrs, we have uh, their beds were made in the highest heaven. Three holy angels around them stand. Saint Patrick meets them with a crown of glory, saying, you're welcome, soldier, from Ireland. And also from the bold rappery. Now the Lord will have mercy on the soul that has fled. He's now gone to rest with the glorious dead. And when up in heaven, the angels will sing. They will welcome the outlaw, the wild rappery. And Henry Glassie cites this, these two songs too. Um, there, there was also a tendency to redirect emphasis from the larger conflict to smaller ones, such as sporting rivalries. Here's an example of the expression of rivalry between Newtown Butler's Gaelic football team and St. Patrick's, two miles away. This played out between uh, when jo Joey Wilson asked um, Jimmy Halpin uh, to sing the Bold 15, and, and um, Jimmy is loyal to St. Pat's patron. To me, the bold 15 is between two teams in Newtown Butler. The team in Newtown Butler won uh, the championship. Jimmy, it's not my team now. Marge, not your team. Joey, not his team. Patron, Newtown Butler. Joey, he knows the song. Jimmy, my team is going now on Sunday. Unintelligible, the expo expo expletive deleted championship. Joey. St. Pat, Jimmy, and I hope they're bait. Jimmy repeatedly protests that Newtown Butler is not his team, but finally under duress, he sings the song. So successful conflict management acknowledged tensions, but with an overriding framework um, of group solidarity. And I'm gonna talk about group solidarity now. Um, so, um, Let's see. So the maintenance of amiable social relations in the community is vital. Local songs that toast neighbors and ancestors are favorites. So um, the presence of Ned, young Ned Crudden inspired the song about his uncle and namesake. Um, and, and we heard that last week, a bit of the Huntsman's Horn in the Early Morn. Similarly, the bent Michael Murray um, um, is invoked when the Bold 15 is sung. Um, and I think we heard a, a bit of the Bold 15 last week. Even when songs were not specifically local, they emphasized people's unity of experience as Irishmen. So people would sing as a company, it's my own Irish home, far across the foam. Though I've oft 
and left it in uh, here to roam though i don't remember all the words in country near or far yet me heart belongs in old ireland the county of armagh i also ex experienced um what i call the dance of deference which served to cement bonds between singers and audience no how no matter how, how much a singer wanted to perform he or she had to make a show of modesty me father, he's 83, he has better songs than me, said um, Jimmy Halpin. And Francie um, Conlon said, well, I sing now. At every turn, singers must bow to the wishes of the audience and every attempt was made to reach consensus. I'm gonna read um, a, a, a transcript here um, when everybody's trying to get um, Moira Boyle to sing. Um, I won't name all the people that are there, but you know, well, okay, John, not McGuire. Go on ahead, Moirid. Pat, sing a decent song. Moirid, what is a decent song? Marge, your pleasure. Willie, your pleasure. Patron, go on ahead, Moirid. Be girl you. Willie, unintelligible. Moirid, sure, I don't know anything about that. John, Moirid here is a good singer. Um, Moirid, jays, I have no songs to sing. Several, go on ahead. Marge, I've heard lots about you. Willie, a good singer she is too. John, go on ahead. Moira, jays, I've nothing sure. God knows if I could sing a diddle and decent song to sing. Willie, take your time. Marge, your pleasure, your pleasure. Moira, will you help me now? I'm not singing on me own. Um, Marge, okay. Willie, right. Marge, good girl. Moira sings come back home to Aaron. So once a singer would take the floor, audience members um, uh, would support him or her with rapt attention. There would be verbal encouragement like good manning during when the song is actually being uh, performed. And then afterwards, the singer would be plied with praise and drink. And then the whole, I called it the request de denial e ellipsis, request acquiescence sequence. And then that would happen some more on, you know, every time a singer um, and an audience would do this, this was constantly shifting and being negotiated. So in a, in a good sing song, um, the, the singer engage, engaged all present. Quote, I remember one Saturday night at Christmas, this is Philip McDermott, everybody took a turn. There was a man, he done MC, and he went round to everybody. Um, if he could, could do a song or recitation, you done it. And everybody that was called that night done something. It was the best night, I think, that was in McQuillan's for a long time. So cooperation and consensus was always sought in the sing song. Function four were five functions of folk, folk song. The singing tradition was integri integrally connected to values, the primary one being the moral imperative to be loyal to whatever group one was affiliated with, no matter um, where one resided, whether it was Newtown, Derry, or New York, one had to act in accordance with group norms in exchange for which the group was expected to provide solace and security against onslaughts from the outside. People were expected to revere their families, especially mothers. We're a mommy society, said Frank McGahern. And uh, uh, an exam one example of a mother's song was, um, goodbye, Johnny dear, and when you're far away, don't forget your dear old mother far across the say. Write a letter now and then and send her all you can. And don't forget where you roam, you're still an Irish man. And I could go and talk a lot more about mothers, but I'm trying to get through a lot of stuff. So um, there was also a strong ethic of neighborliness. People were admonished to, quote unquote, be as a brother and love one another. During the day, that love could take the form of cooperation and swapping. 
When turf was the main fuel in Newtown Butler, it took a minimum of three men to cut and harvest it. And as Sean McMahon told me, that in his youth, um, oh, that in his youth, people would um, help each other um, if if uh, somebody's cattle died um, or or somebody was ill, everybody would sort of chip in. Um, and but in in all instance in all instances, you were expected to subsum to subsume your individual needs to that of the group. And I'm going to sing a little bit of the lorry in the ditch, which is, uh, and I, which uh, the, one of the, the protagonists was the brother of a guy, of a guy that I stayed with, um, Kevin, Kevin West, um, the Bob West was involved in, in the, in this incident. It's to the tune of um, Sean South from Gary Owen. So I'll sing a bit of this. It was on a cold December night. The rain came pouring down. A V8 lorry belonging to Clark was to Newtown Butler bound. The pilot's name was Francie Woods, a man of gallant fame. He parked the lorry at Salahi Gates to court a nice wee dame. He had two navvies on the truck, McDermott and Bob West. They told him not to keep them long. He says, I'll do my best. They waited long and anxiously and hungry they did feel. When Bob West, he when Bob West suggested, I can't get this to scan, that McDermott would take the wheel. So I, I, I can't sing all of it, but so basically, um, so Francie tries to catch up, he borrows a, a, a Bob West bike and he tries to get, catch up with the lorry um, and, or the, the lorry, basically when they try to connect the lorry ends up in a ditch. Okay, let's see. Joe quickly turned her down to third without the slightest hitch. But in trying to re but in trying to reverse the truck, she slipped into the ditch. They called on some kind neighbors who heaved and took the strain. And soon back big Joe and Bob were bound for Salahi Gates again. Some hundred yards along the road, they met Woods in great haste. He had borrowed his brother Kevin's bike, the old V8 to chase. He cursed, he swore, and he said, my boys, this is no fun or sport. And before I go to bed this night, to P. Clark's I'll report. So uh, let's see, I'll go to the last, let's see um, if I can find it. If you had been a good wee boy and brought the men home straight, instead of hooling round the road with Billy's daughter, Kate, this most unfortunate incident would never have taken place. So in view of all, cir all the cir circumstances, I'll dismiss the bloom in case. Well, I left out some, um, but anyway. So whether in day-to-day -day behavior or in the sing song, neighbors were expected to subordinate their individual needs. Um, um, I didn't see a lot of, um, satirical songs, I guess that sort of is, but I said that there were two possible explanations for that lack. One was that the society was so healthy that there was nothing to satirize. That clearly wasn't the truth. The other su suggestion is that there was a considerable under, there was considerable underlying conflict and mistrust exacerbated by the troubles. 
so that people sang songs that would not offend. Um, and there was the desire not to offend. Um, you were supposed to keep latent hostilities latent. Um, other um, writers talked about cons co compensatory friendliness, like Rosemary Harris's old study, Pre Prejudice and Tolerance in Ulster. But at the same time, there was also a great fear and a, a, a fear of being embattled. And people felt, because people felt duty bound to protect um, church and country, even if that meant killing or being killed. That sentiment was expressed by um, when, um, okay, Th there was, again, it was full of ambivalence while people, um, professed community as a value and sought to enact that value in patterns of mutual cooperation and the sing song, it was also permissible to, to, to kill for God and country. I said that there was also a great fear of treachery. I remember when um, a hardware store, store owner was killed while waiting on a customer, a Protestant, one of my Catholic friends said everybody liked him, but he must have done something terribly bad for this to have happened. Um, and also there was a great popularity of the song Kerry and O'Donnell. And the big issue was that not that Kerry and O'Donnell had been involved in the Phoenix Park murders, but that Kerry had turned state's evidence um, against O'Donnell. So, um, okay, so, and on, in the Clonus murder, we have you young, it's a song by Tommy Tinney, you young men of this country, now this a warning take, and don't depend on comrade men or you will make a mistake. So the, it, so the ethic is paradoxical, as I've suggested. Um, finally, we come to function five, which was the notion of entertainment. Um, and to paraphrase Henry Glassy, um, that um, pleasure, the entertainment is giving pleasure, um, is giving, is commute, yeah, conveying pleasure from, uh, giving pleasure to, from one person to another. People find pure pleasure um, um, in the gift, the song and the giving the re reciprocal change that embodied song or the Kaylee. The greater the number of participants in the sing song, the greater was the pleasure um, and, and, or engaged union um, between singers and audiences, Glassy might say. Conversely, Marge, yes. Marge, Marge, we're yes, going to have yes. to wind up soon. Oh, shoot. Okay. Yes, okay. So give you a couple more okay, minutes. Okay, okay, um, okay. Uh, well, I'm going to skip then uh, to, two, to 2016. Um, cause what I described has changed a lot. Um, most of the singers are now deceased. You know, um, you now have, um, the great, um, um, the rise of Kiltus Keltori Aaron. Um, and I want to play just for jollies, um, a song that Q Tumman wrote about, um, um, when his daughter, when his daughter showed up with some bearded guys, which kind of kind of freaked Mr. Tumman out. So let's let's play a little bit of that, and then I want to end with um, John McGuire's daughter singing um, singing a song that she had written about um, the past times in Newtown Butler, kind of a reminiscence. So I'll just close with those two. Marge, both of those yeah. are over two minutes, so I'll play okay. a few seconds of each. Okay, fine. Oh, times have changed since long ago when I was young and free. <laughs> and if you think they're better, so with you I'll agree. We had no car, no radio, no bicycle, no toys. Just tramp the road from place to place along with other boys. Of girls we had plenty, sure we loved them one and all. Twas our favourite pastime coming from a ball. But love, we never talked of us together, we were. 
and run. Sure, silence was our password. Love was always our So what I was going to, okay. So he, he refers in the song to, you know, will people be singing this song in the year 2000? Um, so then I'll, I'll just end. I'm sorry. I always, I always seem to have to rush. In your time, sure, the people are in a class all of their own. Hair hunting, shooting, cockfighting, or sports that are well known. Now in other towns, these sports have died, but in your town, they've stayed strong. With the old and young conspiring to make sure they're carried on. Well, there's a lot I could say. The, the pubs are under new ownership. Um, there are now, as I understand it, pre-arranged monthly sing songs. Um, and so just a lot has changed, especially with uh, Kiltus, sort of the pan-Irish ensemble sessions uh, that young people participate in. And there's a lot I would I there's a lot more that I'd want to explore as I hope to go back again at some point. So I'm sorry that this the rest of this was sort of disjointed, but um, but anyway, there you go. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Marge. Fascinating, as always. Now, I, I, I really, I really do hope that when they pulled the lorry out of the ditch, they sang a sea shanty. <laughs> yeah, maybe a truck shanty, a truck, a lorry a truck shanty. shanty. That would have been good, wouldn't it? Yes. So. <laughs> Thank you again to our all our speakers today, and Marge, and Vienna, and Bob, and Tom. A fascinating afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. We'll be back in a fortnight's time. If you want to um, email Marge about uh, the well, any of the speakers, in fact, the emails are in the. I don't understand that. Uh, that you can see me, Martin. Your your. You can see me silly. Martin, you're not muted. Um, <laughs> people's, people's emails are in the um, announcement that uh, came out before this. You know, that what am I talking about? You've had people's emails. <laughs> You've had people's emails, so you can email them direct if you want to continue the uh, conversation. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody. And we'll see you all, I hope, in a fortnight's time. Very well. Thank you.